Good morning. Thank you for joining us on uh, Palm Sunday here at the First Presbyterian Church. And as we begin, I want to invite us to a few events in the life of a church, which you could find in the back of the bulletins. Uh, so the first thing is, um, during the season of Lent, we've been having noon services uh, here. This week, we will not have those noon Lenten services. Uh, we'll have a 7 p.m. service on Thursday evening, which would be our Monday Thursday service, and an, again, another 7 p.m. service on Friday evening here in the sanctuary, which would be our Good Friday service. And for Easter, we have three services, uh, uh, 8 a.m. service and 11 a.m. service here at the sanctuary with a full choir and brass, and a 9.30 a.m. family-friendly service at the Grand Hall. There would also be um, at 10.30 a.m. by the youth uh, house, there is a celebration for families. Uh, you all are welcome to join for that as well. Uh, so the change is 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. here in the sanctuary on Easter Sunday, uh, 9.30 a.m. at the Grand Hall. On April 11th, uh, we are starting our Spring Evening Alpha series. Uh, Alpha is a listening community designed to help people think through and process their questions and doubts about the faith. Uh, so if you are somebody who knows someone uh, who's thinking through questions and doubts about faith, or you yourself have questions and doubts about faith, uh, you are welcome to this community where nobody will judge you or preach at you. It'll be a safe space uh, for you. Uh, and uh, the last announcement is for the Elder Nominating Committee and the Standing Nominating Committee, uh, which are open for nominations until April the 15th. Uh, so if you know of someone uh, who's a covenant partner who loves Jesus and wants to serve this church, uh, please talk to them and uh, nominate them. Uh, with that, uh, may I invite us all to stand for the call to worship. King Jesus comes, King Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, Messiah. Hail, King Jesus, King of all. Recall the words of the scriptures. A great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. In praise we adore you, King Jesus. Enter our hearts today as you entered Jerusalem long ago. And lead us by faith in the way of everlasting. Amen.
With all that joy, let us pray. God of all, you gave your only Son to take the form of a servant and to be obedient even unto death on a cross. Give us the same mind of Jesus Christ, that sharing in his humility, we may come to be with him in his glory. Our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, at your glorious name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. We bow before you now, our gracious servant King. Amen.
like the people who greeted Jesus as he entered Jerusalem and then later pronounced, crucify him, we are fickle people who often deny Christ in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Remembering the events of Jesus last week helps us to see ourselves for what we are, sinners in need of a Savior, a Savior, praise God, that we have in Christ. In honesty and hope, we confess our sins to God, beginning with a moment of silent reflection. Loving God, you rode a donkey and came in peace, humbled yourself and gave yourself for us. We confess our lack of humility. As you entered Jerusalem, the crowds shouted, Hosanna, save us now. On Good Friday, they shouted, crucify. We confess our praise is often empty. We sing Hosanna but cry, crucify. As the crowd laid their palms in front of you, you took no glory for yourself. We confess that we want to be accepted and take the easy way. We do not stay true to our will. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to follow the way of obedience. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 118. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress called on the Lord, the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord, my strength and my song, He has become my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. In Christ, God answers us and sets us free. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Since God has call, forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, be with you. Please extend the peace to your neighbors.
Let us pray. Father, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, in the form of a man, to be fully God and fully man, and come in as a humble servant to fulfill your will, to bring us salvation. We also, Father, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to remind us of how much you love us. Help us, Father, that at times when we feel the temptation to walk away from your love or forget how much you love us, that you would send the saving conviction of the Holy Spirit to draw us back to your love. And Father, today I pray for people who may have walked into this church feeling unloved, uncared, or lonely. You are a God who comforts those in affliction. I pray for your comfort for people that are suffering. Pray also, Father, for people in our community who may be sick or battling some illnesses, that you would bring healing, and for their caregivers and healthcare workers, that you would give them strength. I pray for people in our community who may have lost a loved one or maybe remembering a loved one that they lost and are grieving through that loss. I pray, pray, Father, that you would embrace them with your love and care and turn their grief to a new hope that you are calling us to. And Father, I pray for our city, our state, and our country, for all the leaders that you have ordained there, that you would give them wisdom and courage to lead us to flourishing. I also pray for peace among the nations, especially in places where there is conflict, the Middle East, Asia, and Africa that you would bring a miraculous peace. And Father, I pray for the brothers and sisters of our faith all over the world, especially in places where they are persecuted, that you would give them strength to be witnesses to your love. And now as the Lord taught us, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debtors as we forgive our debtors. There is a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, at the, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, our Lord says, seek first God's kingdom. And one of the ways in which we seek God's kingdom is through our tithes and offerings. Uh, I want to take this moment to express our gratitude for people uh, who have, for your generosity that has helped us to be here for the gospel and to be here for Houston. And as the ushers come forward with the baskets, I would uh, encourage us to prayerfully consider how God may be leading us uh, to fund the mission of God in this space.
Last night I lay asleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought the voice of angels from heaven answered. My dream was changed, the streets no longer rang. Hushed were the glad Osanas, the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery, the morn was cold and chill. As the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill, as the shadow Again the scene was changed, new earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the tideless sea. The light of God was on its streets, the gates were open wide, and all who would might enter, and no one was dead.
I need a second here to recover from that. A reading from Luke chapter 18, verses 9. He also told this parable, some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up at heaven. He was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves shall be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Thank you, Jim, for opening God's word for us this morning. I'm glad you had to follow the offertory and not me. Got a little break there. Throughout this season of Lent, we have been in a series inspired by the seven deadly sins, which, if we're not careful, can become the seven daily sins. This list was originally conceived by a 4th century monk named Evagrius Ponticus, who eschewed a growing popularity and a bright future in the big city, despite his name. He left it in favor of an ascetic life of self-denial deep in the Egyptian desert. We've called our series Vices and Virtues because he saw these seven deadly sins more as thoughts or, or habits or character traits that can keep us from growing into the virtues of Jesus. So over the past six weeks, we've worked our way from the most carnal of the vices to the deeper, more spiritual temptations. We've seen how gluttony is rooted in self-satisfaction, that when we feel empty, we can overfill ourselves with an extra helping of dessert or another glass of wine. We've seen how lust is rooted in self-gratification. When we feel unlovable, we can use other people to indulge ourselves without giving ourselves in return. Greed is rooted in self-sufficiency. When we don't think we'll get what we need or we won't have enough, we make having more our highest aim. Sloth is a kind of self-justification when we don't want to love other people, so we hold them at arm's length in indifference. Envy is a kind of self-honor when we don't think we're worth anything, so we engineer other people's downfall so we feel at least better than them. And just last week, we thought together about how anger is rooted in self-exaltation, when we're impatient for God to make the world right, and so we take over for him. But every single one, gluttony, lust, greed, envy, anger, and sloth, they all have their roots in one final vice, the seventh of the seven deadly sins, the most spiritual, the one that goes down deepest into our souls. Somehow, in some way, those previous six vices are all rooted in the soil of pride, Each of the previous six vices are like branches of a tree growing in different directions, which will continue bearing forbidden fruit unless we get at the base of the tree, unless we aim our axe at the root of pride, unless we dig up the soil in which it grows. It's not unlike the Ten Commandments that start with, you shall have no other gods before me. Because we cannot break commandments two through ten without first breaking commandment number one, without putting ourselves in God's place, thinking that we know better. Think about it. Uh, Self-satisfaction, self-gratification, self-sufficiency, self-honor, self-exaltation, self-justification. That's a whole lot of self, isn't it? 
Maybe you've heard that old story a uh, hundred years ago when a newspaper held a contest inviting people to submit essays describing what's wrong with the world. And the winning contribution came from an author named G.K. Chesterton who wrote, and I quote, Dear sirs, I am G.K. Chesterton. And some of us ladies here are thinking, well, there was another problem there. He only wrote it to sirs, right? What's wrong with the world, G.K. Chesterton says? Me. I'm what's wrong with the world. All that self supplants God's place, snubs God's power. And so Lent, a season of somber reflection and re repentance, has invited us to meditate on G.K. Chesterton's response and to make it our own. Which of these deadly sins could become for us daily sins? Where have these thoughts, these habits, these character traits infiltrated the soil of our lives? Jesus tells the parable we've just heard as he nears Jerusalem, where he's been traveling in the Gospel of Luke since way back in chapter 9. Remember, this was an intentional turn toward the holy city. In Luke 9, 51, we read, As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. In chapter 13, verse 22, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way toward Jerusalem. In 1831, Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, we are going to Jerusalem, and everything that's written about in the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. And at long last, Jesus nears Jerusalem, and he tells this little story, the only one that takes place in the temple the only one of Jesus' parables that has something to do with going to church. Our 21st century American ears hear the story as if the two men are going to the temple to pray in individual solitary acts. But going to the temple for prayer would have been done in and with the community, either at sunrise or at three in the afternoon. At both times, every day, day in and day out, seven days a week, 365 days a year, a high priest would sacrifice a spotless lamb and then sprinkle its blood on the altar. Then after a reading from the Psalms, worshipers would offer their private prayers to God. While we might hear the word Pharisee with disdain, in the first century, Pharisees were highly honored. They were pillars of society, held in high regard by the rest of the population. You may know, uh, in Jesus' day, there were four main Jewish denominations. The first is the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, which is why they were sad, you see. So good. Every time I say the word Sadducee, I have to make that joke. So... It's written in my contract. Get used to it. <laughs> now, the Sadducees had colluded with the Romans who had taken control of, of, uh, of the Holy Land. They, they figured if you can't beat them, join them. Then there were the Essenes. They lived an ascetic lifestyle out in the desert, much like John the Baptist or Evagrius Ponticus. The Essenes were convinced that society had been so defiled that it was so corrupt, they had to physically move out of the city into the wilderness to stay pure before God. The zealots were ready to take up arms against the Romans. They were ready to fight for the Holy Land, like that time Peter grabbed a sword and cut off the guard's ear. And then there were the Pharisees. Their name, Pharisee, literally means separated one. They lived a holy and righteous life. They summoned Israel to return to God, to repent of their evil ways. And they believed that if enough people lived holy and righteous lives, then God would send the Messiah. That if our human behavior improved enough, then God would save them from Roman occupation. And the Pharisee about which Jesus tells this story was the best of the best. Instead of fasting once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, with his fellow Jews, he fasts twice a week. He tithes on everything, not just the money he makes, but the food he eats as well, just in case the person that sold him to it didn't tithe their earnings. He says, I'm not like those robbers, those evildoers, those adulterers, or even like that tax collector. The tax collector, on the other hand, wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast, 
something no self-respecting first century Jewish man would do. He prays, he pleads simply, God have mercy on me, a sinner. He asks for atonement. He, he, he prays that he would be at one with God. And, and whatever you think about tax collectors, his theology is correct. That's what that sacrifice of the lamb had afforded him just a few moments earlier. Though he wants to draw near to God, he stands far off from the temple. He was not just a back pew Presbyterian. The tax collector was out on Main Street. He believed he wasn't welcome in church because he wasn't welcome in church. It's likely that when Jesus told this story, his disciples had never heard of a tax collector going to pray at the temple before. And one of the greatest ironies of the parable, what gets missed in some of our English translations, is that the Pharisee was out on Main Street too. Not because he didn't feel welcome. No, his tithing had built the place but rather because he was a separated one. Praying too close to other people meant that he could become defiled. He could be ceremonially unclean. But according to Jesus, justification, being made right with God, being at one with God, comes not from something we achieve, but it's something that we receive. The gospel tells us that no matter how much we fast, how much we give, how much we serve, how often we show up at church, justification is not something we achieve, but something we receive. And it is available to both of these men, but only one of them asks for it. Justification is available to each of these men, but only one of them is in a posture to receive it. See, Jesus' subversive little story reveals the insidious nature of pride, how its roots grow secretly under the soil of our lives, how our pride expands unseen. And, and in a way, this Pharisee had a great deal to be proud of. His fasting qu- twice a week kept him aware of and the, away from the danger of gluttony. Uh, his 10% of tithing kept him from the danger of greed. He considers himself innocent of lust and sloth and envy and anger. And and we too have a great deal to be proud of. Whether it's our career or the neighborhood in which we live, uh, the alumni association that we give generous to, or perhaps we're proud that we were born and raised deep in the heart of Texas. I mean, not all of us, I know, but others of us had to get here as quickly as we could but we too have a great deal to be proud of. And we live in a culture that encourages that pride. Just Thursday night, uh, the college at which my father coached cross country and track for 32 years, inducted him into its hall of fame. And so family filled the tables alongside dozens of his former athletes that traveled from all over to be there and to honor him for his accomplishments and his achievements. And it would be a lie to say that our hearts didn't swell with pride. My wife and daughter were unable to attend because uh, my my daughter is involved in this thing at her school. I was unaware of this until we moved here to the Lone Star State, but a program called uh, the Odyssey of the Mind. And uh, and Zoe took place with another, uh, other uh, fourth graders and and went to the the city competition uh, a month ago and placed sixth which meant that they could go to the state competition yesterday. So sixth place, going to the state, we don't expect that they're going to be going to the national competition, of course, right? Until they placed first. Yeah, hey. (laughs) It, It would be a lie to say that my heart didn't swell with pride. My wife and I weren't looking for something to do in another month. We we weren't looking for a trip to Iowa for the national competition, but apparently that's what we're doing. See, there are so many things in our lives that that fill us with pride. How could they not? Whether it's parents or, or children, whether it's siblings or neighbors or coworkers or friends. And in many ways, the individual ability for us to take pride in such things is a result of the impact of the Christian faith. Now, if that sounds like a bold claim, hang with me for just a moment. Prior to the spread of Christianity, civilizations had an increasingly tribal mentality, like the Sadducees and the Zealots and the Essenes. 
where people were aligned with a particular nation or group. We see it here, even in this parable. This man is called a Pharisee. This is the group in which he takes pride. This is his tribal mentality. We don't know his name. We don't know where he lived. We don't know what he did for work. What do we know about him? We know that he's part of the tribe. He's a Pharisee. But the Christian worldview introduced this idea of individuality, that individuals are fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are in the image of God. There is something specific and special about each and every person, that each of us, unique unto ourselves, bears the divine thumbprint of God. Our world may miss this connection, but this grows out of the soil of Christian faith This individual aspect of pride grows from the understanding that God has created us each individually, that he has endowed upon us gifts and abilities. The problem with pride then is that our culture has since distanced and divorced a a, a kind of gospel-based pride that we enjoy from a gospel-based humility, which is the hallmark of receiving the good news of Jesus. The great sin of our culture is quite different even from G.K. Chesterton's just a hundred years ago. In his culture, he recognized the complicity and the brokenness of the world. What's the problem with the world? I am. But now, in our culture, our great sins are a low self-image, a lack of self-confidence, a deficiency of self-assurance. And therein lies the problem with pride. That's the reason the Pharisee goes home unjustified before God. It's not because he prays by himself. It's because he prays to himself. Separated from other worshipers, underneath it all, it's about himself. And it's curious that Jesus tells this one parable, this one little story about church, and that this is the content of this little story. Because if we're not careful, church can be the place where where we can hide best from God where the trees of our lives can be planted in the soil of pride, where we can, if we're not careful, put ourselves in God's place. Church is the place where where we get all dressed up and smile extra big and say, everything's going great. Bless you too. See, the things that prompt our pride, if we're not careful, can preempt our justification, our self-justification. Which, of course, brings us to that great prophet, Indiana Jones. (laughs) Right? You were with me on that. You saw where I was going. Indiana Jones is deep in a cavern in the South American jungle. In that great scene, later, Raiders of the Lost Ark, he's he's finally at a place where this shiny idol sits. He's perched carefully on a a weight-sensitive pedestal. And remember, Indiana Jones guesstimates the, the calculations in his head, and he, and he takes out a bag of sand that's been in his satchel, and he, and he pours a little bit out. And then, looking at this shiny idol, fast as lightning, he grabs the idol and puts the sand in its place so that the weight-sensitive pedal doesn't react, right? And of course, at first, Indiana Jones has this, this smile, this sort of smirk. He, he's got the idol. He, he, it's his at long last. At first, nothing happens, but then all chaos breaks loose. A giant stone bowling ball comes tumbling toward him. Poison darts shoot from inside the walls. Pits open up. Walls slam down. See, the Bible tells us that our hearts are like idol factories, that we're constantly trying to replace shiny objects for bags of sand, that our hearts in some ways are like Indiana Jones, who is nothing if not prideful. And we put ourselves in God's place because of our pride. That even when we've got everything right, like this Pharisee, everything is right for the wrong reasons. Because we put other gods before God, and we're often the first ones on that list. Trusting in our own accomplishments and our own achievements, when we try to replace that shiny idol with a bag of sand, Jesus comes along and recognizes the roots of the tree. As Jesus journeys toward Jerusalem, the scope of his ministry, the shape of his mission becomes even more in focus. Think about his disciples, constantly tempted by pride. The people bring little children to Jesus and his disciples shoo them away. The teacher doesn't have time for these little kids. They they journey along and try to call down fire on their enemies that will not receive them. They try to march ahead of Jesus as if he were leading a revolution. 
In one of my favorite passages, um, James and John, the sons of thunder, convince their mother to ask Jesus if they can sit on his left and his right when he comes into his kingdom. And little do they know who would be on his left and on his right in a few short days. See, Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem and his entrance into the holy city that we celebrate this Palm Sunday, Jesus enters not high and lifted up on a white horse after a military victory like so many others had done. Jesus enters in not on a war horse. He enters in on a colt, purposely enacting the prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9 tells us, See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, but lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus, the high king of heaven, the only one who could justifiably take pride in the kingdom of God he was establishing, could ride in, ride in high and lifted up on a white horse, vanquishing his enemies if he wants, but he doesn't. Instead, Jesus purposely enacts that prophecy of Zechariah 9, that people might see the good news of that first Palm Sunday. And so following this Jesus... Joining him on his left and on his right requires us to dig up the roots of our pride. And to do so, we must become more like Indiana Jones. Gazing upon Jesus with that same intensity that Indy gazed upon that shiny little idol. The problem is that our axe is not sharp enough to break the roots. Our shovels are not strong enough to dig that soil. And God forbid if they were, because that might just give us something to be proud of. See, the only way that we can break the power of pride of our own accomplishments and our achievements, the only way that we can keep from patting ourselves on the back a little bit too hard is to gaze upon this Jesus the same way Indiana Jones gazed upon that idol. It's to trust in Jesus' sacrifice at the end of that week in Jerusalem. That Jesus took the place of those spotless lambs that would give their lives at sunrise and at 3 p.m., the author of Hebrews in chapter 9 says that Jesus offered himself at the culmination of the ages to end the system of sacrifice so that all who would trust in him would receive the good news of eternal life. So that we might be justified. So that we might be at one like that tax collector at the temple. The apostle Paul concludes this. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. And being found in human likeness, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so, God, we give you thanks for the many accomplishments and achievements of our lives. We give you thanks that you have given us many things to be proud of, and yet we ask that you would help us to keep that pride in perspective. That the things that we have to be proud of would not prompt us to place ourselves in your way. That we would remember that first commandment to seek you above all else. And that this holy week we would journey with Jesus as he enters Jerusalem. Not high and lifted up. Not in honor and glory and pride. But lowly meekly, humbly. May we follow after his example this holy week that we might be justified, that we might be atoned, that we might be made right with you, celebrating his sacrifice on our behalf. It's in the name of Jesus and for the sake of his inbreaking kingdom we pray. Amen.
Hear again these words. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Go in peace.